that sounds like a 12 string guitar to me when that little mm. lead comes in it does i know sweet Beautiful. reminds me of pink floyd yeah it's true yeah he's got something special going there with that roof <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. All right, so we're all set up. We're going to do uh, Augustine City of God. Oh, no, City of God, um, Spirit in the Letter. Uh, that's what we were going to do, like good, disciplined uh, disciples. But Mick called me a chicken, and, and he wants to talk about this whole <laughs> um, the Black Lives Matter stuff. So I'm like, I ain't no chicken. I'll talk about it. <laughs> and I'm just like, I don't really care. And he's like, oh, you should care. And now I feel like convicted and stuff. And so anyway. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Everyone is talking about it anyway. I just hate being that guy, that guy that jumps on the bandwagon. But I think it's been around long enough now to show it's substantial enough to talk about. I just don't want to jump on every stupid little wave that goes, uh, you know, along. But but it's, um, you know, it's it's turning out to be a big thing. It's kind of like that coronavirus thing that we just had. So let's talk about it. Um, Man, where do we start? Where do we start with a subject like this? What's your um, position on it, Nick? Okay, well, let, let me start. Let well, me start. let me guess. Been... Cultural Marxism. <laughs> no, 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 okay. no. Uh, no. I wanted to start with a balanced mm-hmm. perspective where I, I, if, I were, if my, my congregation came to me and they said, Nick, what do you think? What should our response be as Christians? What should we think of this? I would say I think our response needs to be twofold. It needs to be sympathetic and it needs to be discerning. Yes, I agree. So not... I think it's totally possible to you know um uh relate to all of the angst and yet not subscribe to any of the the you know critique. undergirding critique yeah. uh, slash um you know just all the all the stuff that we know is just uh, has an agenda and i think everyone's starting to see that to some degree or another yeah yeah for sure mm. so i mean just in terms of uh you know the empathy side uh, you know who shy Lin is i think you even introduced me to him did i yeah wow. So he's the rapper guy, the performed new Calvinist. Yeah. Yeah. So he was, he was just writing a, a little talking about his experience as a black man. Uh-huh. And uh, he just shares the story about how his, you know, his little four year olds at school saying, uh, you know, daddy, people are laughing at me because I've got brown skin. I don't want brown skin anymore. I want white skin. I hate having brown skin. And so like, he's just talking about, you know, the minority experience. And I think, right. you know, we're living in a context where emotion makes something true. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, we sell things through emotion. And um, so a lot of people are, are identifying with a lot of people's experience in terms mm-hmm. of ex- mm-hmm. experiencing the minority experience. Mm-hmm. And I think there is, there is a real thing going on called racism that's in culture that we're all mm-hmm. guilty of. Right. And a lot of people are hurting and there needs to be deep sympathy. We need to call a citizen and say, speak out against racism. Mm, mm. But, uh, but then you get things like white privilege, systemic racism, and uh, a bunch of other ideas, which are, I think, politically uh, defined and motivated. Yeah. And that's where the critique needs to come in. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, and one of the reasons I've been reluctant to even go down this path is, I mean, you know, again, the experience is important. It does factor in to all of this. And, um, you know, we're two South African white guys. You know, so there's just that, you know, and it's, it's like, you so get a does sense. Does that delegitimize what we're going to say? No, but it does. It, you do. I, I just know how it works, right? You just, yeah. you're disqualified out of the gate, you know, and yeah. at the end of the day, fair enough, you know, I'm sorry I was born in South Africa at the wrong time. I get it. You know, it's like, I didn't actually have a lot to do with that, you know, in terms of just being born in that place in that time. But I get it. Like, no one's going to care about that. You just, you are a South African white guy. Uh, and it's just, that's the bottom line. So, you know, fair enough. It is what it is, but no, I think, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, if, if it's possible to, um, you know, if people are willing to, to, uh, listen beyond that point, I mean, it's, you know, I would, I, I, you know, there's a lot to say, there's enough to, um, contribute to the conversation. Certainly, even I think that perspective that we have probably does bring something unique to the table as well. Um, and, you know, it, I, I mean, I feel like I've gone through all of this already, you know, at, at, at a very deep level. I remember being 14 and, yeah. um, and I remember when Nelson Mandela came to, came to power and, and, um, 
you know, just going through all of this and just not even realizing what racism was. And then I realized like, wait a minute, I am in a racist community. And uh, not only that, but at this like unprecedented level, you know, and the whole world knows about it. And wow, it's kind of like you, you realize you're in uh, the Hitler sort of uh, the Nazi regime, you know, as, as someone yeah. who's coming to consciousness about it, but, and, and then you have to deal with it, you know, and there is a sense of guilt. I mean, like, my goodness, that sucks. I don't want to be part of that, you know, and you, you sort of, yeah. you have to go through the whole process of just, oh my goodness, how can I be, how can, and I think this is a, almost a, a corporate South African thing from what I remember anyway, before I left in that, um, you know, it was just every, everyone's trying their best to kind of work at that. And, and just figure it out. And, you know, it was admittedly, uh, and, you, know, com- you know, and it was real racism, you know, uh, not, yeah. not, not to discount what's going on uh, in other countries, but obviously it was a, 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 you know, a glaring example of the problem. Uh, you didn't have to dig around, you know, it was, uh, everyone knew about it. So, um, so I think things like affirmative action, Things like, uh, you know, the, the com- what was it called again? The uh, Council for Truth, Truth and, Reconciliation. and Reconciliation Commission. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of that from a religious perspective, there was a lot to say there. Um, you know, and this, 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 I mean, this was like my whole teenage, all my teenage years into early 20s. You know, just this is yeah. every single day, you know, um, getting to know good friends that became, you know, just best friends and just of different color. That was a unique new experience in South Africa. It was just, I didn't know that a lot of people go through that kind of stuff. You know, it's, it's it's, girlfriends. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like, which, you know, that would be normal, like on a normal sort of in a normal space in a normal time, but to have come to a normal from a deep abnormal is just like, it's, it leaves a mark on you, you know? And, um, yeah. And so I think, you know, as I look at that, I just realize I'm, I've got a bit of an imbalance, you know, as I, as I talk about it, I realize I'm not coming at it from your normal situation. Um, if, at some level, you know, it, it feels like I was kind of hoping, you know what I was hoping? I was hoping South Africa would, would, would react better to all of this. Um, that's what I was hoping. I was hoping that they'd see the problem in the States. They'd be like, you know what? This is the, at least the one thing we've kind of handled, you know, and, yeah. uh, and, you know, perhaps show a bit more of a, a role model in, in how to deal with it, but it hasn't gone that way. So that sucks. Um, I suppose, you know, I'm out of touch with what's going on in South Africa now, but that, that, you know, I feel like that. I wish that went differently. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess um, <clears throat> something that I'm struggling with, and this is part of, you know, moving away from the sympathy side to the critique side mm. is um, I've been trying to sort of do some catching up on critical race theory trying to do some catching up on the whole notion of woke, yeah. trying to, you know, um, these, the, the, there have been a, a whole bunch of undercurrents of neo-Marxism that have been inf- influencing political thought. Um, I did, a, I did some, a lot of work in liberation theology when I was in right. Bible college. So having reacquainted myself with what's going on recently, it's like, Oh, hang on. This is very similar. You know, right. God's always on the side of the oppressed. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that sort of theological way of thinking is still right. undergirding a lot of stuff. Right. And um, I just thought a useful uh, sort of a useful critique and uh, a way of because I think what I'm really bothered about is where people start talking about systemic racism. I believe that racism exists. I believe that mm-hmm. racism is wrong, but I'm, I don't believe that what people are calling systemic racism in every instance mm. is necessarily systemic racism. Mm. Um, so this is where the cultural Marxist thing comes in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, the, the, so it's the, the whole discussion that goes on in political thought is um, equal opportunities versus equal outcomes. Mm-hmm. Uh, equal opportunities is, you know, traditionally the capitalist point of view. Equal outcomes is traditionally the communist point of view. Mm-hmm. So these things are already pitted against each other. Um, and so justice as defined by a capitalist is, well, let's, let's treat everyone as equal. Let's give everyone the opportunity to be educated. Let's give everyone the opportunity to get a bank loan. Let's give everyone the opportunity to start a business. Let's give everyone um, a low tax on their business so that they can do well. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. Uh, Equal outcomes is pretty different. And we've experienced this in affirmative action. Um, My my uncle wanted to commit suicide. He was a middle, middle middle-aged white guy. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was about to kill himself because he couldn't get work. Mm. And um, so equal outcomes basically says something like this. You know, if you've got a, a board of directors and there are 10 people on it and there aren't, um, 
at least five white guys and five black guys or black women or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, if, if there are only two black people on the board of directors, we need to force an equal outcome mm -hmm. and we need to bring the balance in. And mm -hmm. so it's a different definition of justice. Right. Yeah, totally. So I suppose the way I processed all of that growing up um, was, you know, I was kind of happy to play my part. You know what I mean? In that it was, it was just, I suppose, getting over, you, you realize, oh my goodness, look what we've been part of. I was embarrassed to be white. You know, I remember, you know, a legitimate feeling coming over me. I mean, you just literally, I didn't know, you know, I, I can honestly say that. I'm not saying I wouldn't have been part of it if I had known or anything like that. I'm just saying growing up, you just growing up, that's all you're doing. And uh, I suppose you should have figured stuff out beforehand, but you didn't. And then you do. And then it's just like, oh, you're all grossed out with your, your whole deal. And then I was just like, okay, you know, obviously freaking, you know, let me take a back seat on everything, you know, and I'm happy to be the, the guy who's being discriminated against if that could even be used to, to describe, uh, you know, the, the situation that I was in in affirmative action. But, um, you know, it, it just, I just put it in that bucket. Admittedly though, you know, I'd never been crunched on it, you know, the, as you've just described, it, it, I never came to the point where it was like, you're I'm trying to feed my family. Um, you know, needing an income. I mean, it was all fun and games really growing up at that level. You know, you just have your, your own mouth to feed and, and you can just get it done in one way or another. So, you know, again, you're just, you're just filtering a lot of that through experience. Um, so, but why that, why that matters, I think, is because, you know, if you think about this whole corporate guilt deal and um, the way we would then own, you know, the, the sins of our ancestors, so to speak, I mean, I think, I think, you know, with, you know, I want to, my, my, my theology wants to go, no, 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 we don't do any of that. And no, you know, I'm <laughs> against all of it and um, social gospel, not, not interested. And, um, you know, I don't care. Liberation theology is obviously freaking messed up at every level. So no, um, not interested. And yet I realized like, probably the way I process things is, is a little bit different. You know, there's a bit of an inconsistency in the, in the way that I actually look at it. Um, maybe a little bit of two kingdoms comes into that. Maybe it's more like an Anabaptist thing, you know, where I'm sort of assuming, I'm, su I'm assuming that, you know, the world is pretty darn messed up and, you know, you, you go into it with that assumption. Again, I think the South African thing might've played some role in that, but you, you know, I come to New Zealand, I'm not thinking everyone's not racist. You know what I mean? Like I've, yeah. it's, it's an obvious point that this is something that is deeply inwoven in every human heart. And uh, this is something we have to fight. And, you know, so, so when that's why it gets quite confusing because the calls to fight injustice you know uh that's loving your neighbor you of course you have to do that you know Amen. who who doesn't do that that's like it's, it's the fact that we even have to make that point is ridiculous but it just gets that that gets turned into a catchphrase for something that actually you have no intention of being part of uh, you know whether it be um some sort of liberation theology or otherwise social gospel so um and it's very difficult to separate the rhetoric from what's going on i mean you know trusted you know the, i think the experience that people are having right now is hey why are all my friends Marxists? That uh, that podcast that came out the other day, I thought John that was Harris. brilliant. Yeah, you know, and I think that 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 sort of sums it up in that you, they were my friends, and you know, we kind of knew each other, and you know, I thought we were on the same page on a whole lot of things, and then all of a sudden, like yeah. someone's just towing the party line, another one's bidding hook, line, and sinker. Everyone's saying things that used to sound familiar, but now are just contorted with all sorts of agendas. And uh, to try and separate all of that is, is, is the true nightmare behind all of this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess what, uh, what I'm just very aware of as a pastor is, you know, Christians are disagreeing with each other on these issues. Mm, yeah. You've got, you've got some Christians who are um, completely on board. They're getting on their knees. They're confessing their white privilege. They're asking for forgiveness to the new priesthood. <laughs> right, right. And then you've got others who are saying, no, this is wrong. And, um, you know, that's why I think this double approach, there's, there's truth on both sides, isn't there? There's, there's, a, yeah. there's a, the necessity to, to see the sin and, and sympathize with it and not be cold and abstract and distant mm. and critical. Mm. Mm. Then on the other hand, we can't, we've got to be aware of the presuppositions and the political ideology that's underlying the critique. Exactly. And you see the two sides discount <laughs> both of those things because you know the the people that will want to really empathize um will do so to the neglect of some 
really important theology that's being compromised. And I'm just, I'm not willing to go there. You know, uh, it's, as soon as we are talking, I want to be as clear as I could ever be on that. As soon as we are talking anything that is a social gospel, and, and you know, I am seeing that. People that I didn't think were even capable of moving in that direction are now talking in ways that I've only ever identified to a very, very liberal form of social gospel. So I don't want to be part of that. I, I think that is nonsense. I stand against that as I always have. And, you know, that's not even a race thing. That's just a, a theology thing. That's a gospel thing. I think we, we need to be prepared to do that. But, um, you know, it's interesting because then you are seeing the other way around. You're seeing the guys that are just going on that theology trip, truly forgetting to be empathetic, you know, truly. Not listening not, to the stories. Not listening not to the stories. Not identifying with the real issues. Yeah. Right. So as always. I land in the perfect point of balance and uh, it, it is hard. The golden mean. <laughs> it is hard to just be so darn balanced all the time. You know? <laughs> yeah, you see everyone yeah. falling off the sides and you're just there right in the middle. But, uh, you know, it, well, let, let me, let me throw yeah. out an example of uh, just one of the, the theological issues. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, that a lot of people are talking about repenting of uh, white privilege. Mm-hmm. That white people who have uh, basically got their education, got their opportunities, got their experience of life on the backs of those who've been held down and oppressed. Mm-hmm. And now as a part of becoming woke, you need to recognize the systemic problems and mm-hmm. you need to own your white privilege. You need to repent of your white privilege. This is the only way of moving forward so that we can, we can have a s- systemic change. Right. Right. And um, I guess, you know, just purely from a theological point of view, when I hear the word repent, mm-hmm. um, it's got certain connotations, gospel current connotations. And I think if we, if we can, oh, yeah. uh, we, we can cheapen the word by, uh, <clears throat> by throwing it around in terms of repenting of white privilege. Mm-hmm. So when I repent, when I, when I get converted, faith and, re- and repentance being part of conversion, yeah. I own my sin to the yeah. deepest extent. Yeah, yeah, it's not my it's not my mother, it's not my brother, but it's me, oh Lord. You know, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I'm blaming no one but me. I can't yeah. blame. I, you know, it's um, it's it's culpability all the way down to the the, <clears throat> the bottom of my feet here. So I can't repent for other people's sins, mm-hmm. and it's it's breaking God's laws what I'm repenting for, mm-hmm. and so it's. <sighs> There are, there's lots of ambiguity in terms of what's culturally acceptable, which mm-hmm. is being called white privilege. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so I think we just have to guard the term. We need mm-hmm. to define our terms. We need to be aware of how we're speaking. That is where I think a, a, a two kingdom-ish angle actually counterintuitively actually helps with this stuff because it's almost like you are able to, and a lot of this folds into a lot of the critique that where you have, you know, people come in and saying, Hey, I, I don't believe in a social gospel. The answer to the world's problems is just preach the gospel. You know, God, the gospel will transform hearts. And of course, well, everyone who's a Christian believes that, you know, uh, yeah. that, that's, but it's not people are getting frustrated with other people saying that because it's not actually going to help because not everyone is going to believe the gospel and you're not going to have this massive, you know, answer to the, to the problem that people are currently complaining about. So, you know, unless of course there is this mammoth revival, that's the only way that that's actually going to help. So it's almost like a kind of transformationalism. It's putting too much weight on, on what the gospel needs to do. The gospel, you know, it will save some and that will have an effect on the community. Certainly it will be salt and light and, but it won't change everything. It won't, no. it won't take a penultimate imperfect <laughs> scenario uh, and, and turn it into utopia. You know, it's just not going to happen. So you need that common grace aspect of beyond what, what, what the gospel addresses. You have to factor that in. And it's almost like you could have, you know, and this is, I'm not thinking now in, in terms of the way that this is being abused. And as you, you know, so I'm not contradicting your point, but just saying, you know, in the way that you respond in the way that you can consider things, uh, I think it is wise to talk about a repentance that is, as you say, before God, internal, salvific, soteriological, but then also to keep in mind that there is a kind of turning away from things that is not salvific. It's not intended to be, it's a common grace kind of turning away. It's a, you know, you can imagine, um, you know, a country never deciding to use nukes again, you know, no more nuclear warfare yeah. for us. There's a repentance there. It's no one's assuming it's self, it's salvific. It's just something that we're all agreed upon as a nation. And so I think there is room for that. You know, there's certainly, um, 
you know, it can be overplayed. It can be turned into something it's not meant to be. It, you can mix categories. That's where all the, all the problem comes in um, from both sides, from the Marxist side and the Christian side. But I think um, there is some room to play there in the middle, you know, with. There is. With, I think the, the, the difficulty, and I think what's really muddying the waters, is I'm being told that because of the color of my skin, mm. that I am bearing the guilt mm. of past generations. Right. Yeah. So now, here's where I think this helps where you go, okay, I can't accept that at a salvific level or at a, you know, personal repentance, yeah. you know, soteriological level. But even I at mean, a responsibility I've, level, so that repentance for th- things I haven't done, you know, that connection. Well, well, you know, and this is where I go, but that's kind of why I mentioned my, my bringing South Africa experience, because I feel like I can't totally, I'm, I'm not expressing some like, hardcore principle of corporate solidarity or with my ancestors or anything like that. But what I am doing is just feeling absolutely totally embarrassed about, and you know, feel being sorry. part of yeah, so, and, so sorrow is a key thing. And feel sorry for them. Feel sorry. Totally, exactly. And I want to do whatever I can do, you know, so whatever, whatever can help, whatever you think. And I'm just, I, I don't care about my wife freaking skin. So whatever, you know, I, I'm yeah. happy to, I'm happy to throw that away for you. If, if that's what you want, like, I'm not, there's nothing precious about that. Uh, you know, other than, you know, th- that that's who I am and that's what I got to do. And so I'm happy to play into that situation, help wherever necessary, you know? And so I want to be always, uh, you know, and then I just put that in the loving your neighbor category, actually, as a Christian, you know, it's happening anyway as a, as a human being, but you, you're, uh, you've, there, there's some sense in which you're, you're willing to work with what's going wrong. You're seeing the, the people that are, are feeling just obviously, I mean, you know, this is what I keep feeling. This is happening again and again for me. I'll go through some extremely lame experience, you know. I think I think we've all we could all if we rack our brains, we've all suffered some form of injustice, right? Um, totally. You know, and it, it it ranges from the serious to the really mild and irritating. But what is a common denominator? All that is just drives you nuts, you know. The idea of of being just not getting justice, that facing this unjust scenario, and I think you know. It, it, to to grow up in a situation, even if it hasn't been the, the common situation for so many people who are black, you know, if if there are some people, if Maori, black, whoever, you know, any minority yeah, group that's going yeah. through some suffering there, I mean, that freaking sucks, you know, and you and you totally can't even understand how bad that sucks, and you have to you have to just appreciate your your freaking idiot, you know, when, when you're you know when you're talking about something you just don't even know how badly it sucks. So all I'm saying is like, you have to be able to look at that and go, all right, I'm going to bend over backwards for that. I'm going to help wherever I can. I don't want, it's not like I'm being pressured along to, you know, go and be part of a riot or anything, you know, but it's, and no one's going to make me like, you know, do some weirdo, you know, sort of repentance thing on my knees, but I am willing to, to, as a love thing, you know, as a, as a, as a neighbor thing to just go, dude, that freaking sucks so bad. And I'm totally with you, you know? Um, yeah. So it's obvious it's coming from somewhere, you know, it's coming from years of just something. And you've got to see that. We'd be idiots not to see that. So that's the danger. That's the, the, the very delicate balance here. You have to be able to deal with that, empathize well with that without crossing the line on that, on some yeah. weird ideology. And it's almost, you know, almost impossible to do. Let's go ahead and say it, um, <laughs> you know, because you have to be so together all the time. Probably what it's more going to look like is, too far, not far enough, too far, not far enough. But I mean, that doesn't mean you don't have to do anything. So, yeah. So, as I'm listening to some, as I'm listening to the Christian, you know, the, the right wing criticize the left wing, as it were, I'm hearing a lot of frustration in terms of um, uh, who is a racist and who isn't a racist. You know, like yeah. black people can't be racist because they're right. not in power. Yeah. Only people in power can be racist. So, that's those are communist uh, ideologies. Yes. But uh, just, because I think what's happening as well is I think people are confusing uh, an experience of prejudice with an experience of racism. So let me yeah. let me share yeah. my experiences of prejudice. Okay. Remember when I had the big beard? Oh, so uh, it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. I need to I need to bring it out again. But talk um, about feeling the need to repent. Of yeah. <laughs> so you got a lot of white privilege going on there. So. <laughs> <laughs> I do, especially on the sides. Yeah, yeah, real white, Man. the right side. Yeah. And uh, so um, I'd walk walk down the street. So I walk to work. I walk six kilometers every day. I've got my big big hoodie on. Mm-hmm. Got my headphones in. I'm walking in my cons. Got my skinny jeans on. Dang and right. a woman, a, a woman starts. You know, she's in her 
she's in a little exercise thing and she's going for it and she sees me and she crosses the road. Oh my goodness, classic. I would cross the road. Dude, it happens to me like every second day. <laughs> and then a teenage girl comes up and she's, she's been told that when you strange danger, you, you yeah. take a photograph of the person to intimidate them so they don't make advances. So I've had several young girls. I think it's probably, maybe they're just testing out what they've, they've been taught at school. Dude, you're but like, a badass black, looking dude. You know, imagine I was black or Asian or Chinese. Yeah, yeah. You know, I could be a very oversensitive about that, couldn't I? Oh yeah. yeah, I could, yeah. I could make a big thing for, for for beards. You know, let's 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 not be prejudiced against beards now. Come on, now. right, right, you know? right. Yeah. <laughs> but and the point I want to make is this: is that there is just bias and prejudice and fear, it's and woven ignorance, into yeah, and universal, yeah, yeah. And um, and I think that what's happening is we're politicizing. Uh, people have politicized the black versus white thing in order to push a black agenda or a particular political agenda that serves black people in a particular way. Yeah, um, totally. And, and even yeah. with, you see what the thing is, even talk, talking about Black Lives Matter is even unhelpful at this point because, uh, you know, just from what I've seen, in a few weeks, there's such a range of views within that movement. It's almost important. You get the extremists, you get the moderates, you get the, you know, just guys going along that really, if they're pushed, they're, they'd be completely reasonable about all of these things. And then you get the criminals who are just jumping around looting places. And, you know, it's just like, you can't even talk about it. It's not even one unit of, of people, no. really. And so I think uh, immediately the whole thing is discounted. Whenever I'm hearing any, any kind of talk about Black Lives Matter this or, you know, all lives matter. and It's just all just nonsense because nothing is even addressing anything. You know, there's just, people need to be way more specific about what they're talking about because it's just, um, it's just uh, unhelpful at, at the core. And then the fact that it just fuels into this massive ongoing, you know, and then social media, add that to the flame. Oh my goodness. And, you know, it's just a train smash, you know, and, and yet this is, this is what we have to deal with. So I think it is important to talk about and be able to distill some principles out of, yeah. um, you know, again, like just to understand and from a Christian perspective, certainly, I mean, we have to be able to, you know, just kill off the utopian delusions. We have to be able to um, you know, understand the nature of original sin and what is woven into our heart and others. We have to know what can be accomplished realistically, what is not even the goal, you know, at this point, um, at, you know, and, and what the gospel is and what it isn't. You know, those things all just need to be there, you know, like these guardrails that are basically keeping us from moving over yep. the edge. Yep. Um, and uh, I mean, just in terms of, uh, you know, trying to bridge the gap between the two uh, extremes, uh, uh, I think postmodernity and, uh, you know, just being self-critical has taught us that in order to get a better bearing on what the other side believes, listen to their stories, read their books. Mm. Um, and I think, I don't know, that's helped me, you yeah, know, just, just reading a few people who I disagree with, Oh man, just to have them not to agree with their worldview, agree with no. their critique, yeah. but just to hear their experience that... Okay, so there's a legitimate experience that I want to identify with, and I don't want to belittle that. Oh man, and, I want to say and, that they've yeah. they've experienced racism. Exactly, and you, um, I may you not know. agree with their systemic analysis of it. Yep, yep, yep. But I can't belittle the experience. No, and you have to think critically about all this stuff, and and the thing is, if you don't do that, you are being an idiot. You know, you are yeah. being a bigoted idiot if you don't just at least do that. How can yep, you not totally. do that? You have to be able to do that. I think that's a point we can make with absolute certainty. You've got to listen. You've got to just analyze. You've got to, you can't just come out there guns blazing. Even if you're right, you're going to be yeah. wrong. You know? And the other thing you've got to do is you've got to meet face-to-face -to, -face to have discussions because social media is, it just doesn't cut it as a platform. Let's start a movement. It doesn't work. Facebook Let's... doesn't work. Even blog, blogging at each other and podcasting yeah. at each other doesn't work. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it's true. Can't, can't argue with that. It's just sucks that we, I mean, I would, I would, I would, if, if it was even, a, I suppose this is where the utopian delusion thing comes in, but like, I, you know, I realize that I would like to kill off Facebook very quickly. Yeah. I, I would do it. If there was a movement for that and it could work, I'd be part of it. Uh, yeah. Along with all social media, you know, I just, let's kill it. It's not worth it. It's not working. <laughs> um, but it's not going to happen. So here's our grid now. This is what we work with. So I suppose we, we have to, um, you made the point earlier, either we were talking um, before this or, but you know, people are just learning to deal with stuff via that grid or through this emotional sort of um, response tactic. And um, it's almost like, and I think you make a great point that basically you can't run away from that. You've got to, the only thing we've got is to be able to use that same grid to be able to 
inform yeah. and create some semblance of critical thinking or or um or just um you know understanding surrounding the gospel that will at yeah. least aid the situation so and that's you know it's not ideal as you know so just to add to that point i mean it's not it's not by any stretch ideal but sometimes it's all we got which is what we're doing right now i suppose you know just adding a little piece of the pie not in the hopes that it's going to like, wow, this is going to solve anything. But just, I think the accumulative effect of hearing some sane voices, which of which I am definitely one. Oh, definitely. I mean, I'm I am fine. probably the sanest of them all, you know, <laughs> but uh, you know, we've already spoken about my in, in, intense balance. Like yeah, I just, yeah. just know how to balance, you know, but, but beyond that, I'm just completely sane. So yeah. That's good. All right. So on that point of pure sanity, let me, um, let me end with something that I, we haven't actually talked. I wanted to talk more about this, but just for the sake of keeping this thing listenable, um, you know, two kingdoms, the church, what do you do at church? What do you preach upon social gospel, all that stuff? I mean, if you haven't read Christianity and liberalism by Gresham Machen, then uh, you have to, you know, if anyone's listening to this, uh, it's just, it's in season, right? Right now. It, it, there is a lot in this book that is just um, worth. I mean, it's just, it's just constant. It's abiding, you know, it's, it's, it's just a perpetual thing, but um, he ends off the book in a very memorable and famous way. And I think he's just helpful, especially if you're a pastor listening to this and you're thinking, how am I going to approach this? Or, you know, try and remember that there's a difference between you out there in the world as a Christian and you gathered as the church. And there is a different thing you have to worry about there and the church organism and organization, all of those two kingdom goodies are important. But um, Machen ends his whole thing, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, social sort of gospel oriented stuff where it's all politics and it's all coming into the church. And uh, there was no, you know, there's no rest from this. And then the very gospel itself is being diluted and distracted uh, by these issues, you know, being issue driven rather than gospel centered. And, um, and he said, is there no refuge from strife? Is there no place of refreshing? where a man can prepare for the battle of life. Mm. Is there no place where two or three can gather in Jesus name? Just think about this, what we're going through right now, right? Is there yeah. no place where two or three can gather in Jesus name to forget for the moment, all those things that divide nation from nation, race from race, to forget human pride, to forget the passions of war, to forget the puzzling problems of industrial strife and to unite in overflowing gratitude at the foot of the cross. If there be such a place, then that is the house of God and that the gate of heaven. It's good. It's good. And from under the threshold of that house will go forth a river that will revive the weary world. Mm, mm, mm. It's good. So good. don't, don't give up the gospel <laughs> preaching guys, you know, <laughs> just go to church, go to church. <laughs> exactly. Go to church and get it done. son. all right, cool. Sweet. Let's Cheers. let's let's start out. Here we go. Um, fancy dancy, play out now. Mm-hmm.